Hello and welcome everyone to YouTube Masterclass. This is Dr. Sheedy. I got my PhD in Aesthetics and Philosophy at Harvard, as well as California Institute of the Arts. I've been teaching this Masterclass now for almost a year and a half, and we're headed into the last five or four classes left of Masterclass. We have about five classes left, counting this one, so there's not me need to go and we're counting down the list and as we're counting down to the final episode of the D.W. Griffith this is auteur remember that the word auteur means author and it's often referred to the camera as the camera pen or the stylus or the the camera is the author is the movie which is why the director is the most important aspect of the movie this is like a theory that goes to Andre Bazan to Andrew, Andrew Saris makes it popular in America. But I've brought forth some movies that reflect the different eras of filmmaking, but also really reflect a sort of syntax to the film, even though most of them are post to modern. But they represent a syntax that's familiar with the Griffith dialectic. I mean, one I could take right off the bat before I finish the other point I was making that CalArts, USC, and Harvard are giving units for this class, and we have five to go, so that's how you do this marker, but There Will Be Blood, and Birth of a Nation, and even There Will Be Blood, and mainly Intolerance, bear semblance in the fourth act of Intolerance that splices in and out as though it's not really just stuck in fourth act. The acts all switch around, we talked about that, but... There Will Be Blood has the technology almost of the industrial era, which is coming along to be the technological era after that. But the industrial era is taking factories and workers, and he's getting going to get the factories built from the ground up as an oil worker. The poor peasant may not resolve resemblance and intolerance in the fourth act, but the peasant is like not without drive to save his family from being taken over by the baby taken away and the mom taken to jail or the asylum or worse. He's about to be hung. These similar strategic melodramatic notes are how they kind of, it seems to be exaggerated, but it's like this picture on There Will Be Blood. It's like it seems to be this wide exaggerated shot and then yet it's depth of focus on the front third to the right of the picture and that's how a lot of this movie is shot like it's shot in such widescreen that he's using the whole screen like a painting and i think that paul thomas anderson can use film more like a painting more than griffith because griffith's trying to organize pictures and i think that um there with be blood is a far superior example of the opening of the technological revolution that came from the industrial revolution that was all because of the first thing that happened was they struck oil and oil's been nature's alibi to be the most wanted thing by man on the planet than anything is oil for gasoline for a vehicle so that you can go places and travel places and this is going to start it all and it's like that movie the iron horse that john ford directed and you see how they're building this giant train and in these movies they're building like these giant mine shafts with so they can strike oil and it's a beautifully photographed wonderfully acted film has the advantage of sound to it but i'm just saying you can kind of see this antecedent in the fourth layer of intolerance where you see at the end that the man is about to die and hang and, and it's not like this is this is more of a hanged man, but not really. He's more of like becoming himself. And, and is it really megalomania or does he have to take care of the business any way he can kind of movie? Except we're looking at him as though maybe he's not the nicest guy, but he's a guy we're really interested in finding more out about. And it just invites you into the real like human spirit of the film. I think it's cool that on the one hand, he's done some things that no one would be proud of. It's a pretty amazing life to be the one to have discovered the oil and taken care of it. And it's so fantastic you get wrapped up in it, and I've seen it a number of times. Probably about as many times as I've seen Intolerance. 
And Intolerance is like, got the modern angle to it. You know, There Will Be Blood is set in that kind of an era, back when this kind of an era was modern day for its time. So that's another big difference, is the modern day era they're shooting in was their own era, which was in like 1916. And then There Will Be Blood is here in 2007. So one other aspect I wanted to draw attention to in this kind of shooting is that, that interestingly enough, that dramatic sequence in the modern shooting time of that film and many others that have come along that are like silent films made into sound films, but like they're so focused on the visuals that like the silent film becomes like kind of a help to style this compose, like use the author criteria of another criteria director. It's like that. I always explain this, that it's like Cecil B. Demented, like everybody's got to take on the certain characteristics of all their favorite directors, you know, and then you just become like this multi-functional being, not really because... You know, you don't see the, the people populating the film of the silent film as rigidly performed in acting ability, although in the vein of the modern acting style, there there is no other way to go than there will be blood because even in intolerance, they're in their own day. And I just prefer one to the other. I think it's more interesting to sit back and watch a film that even has the sound. So maybe Andrew Bazan was right. Like, maybe sound film could be seen as superior. I mean, it's not that it's really a superior medium. It's a more technologically advanced medium, which is not always the medium we go for, but almost always. In 98% of the case, we go for the more technologically advanced film. And I'm saying the good thing is about intolerance on the fourth side of it in the modern era, because it doesn't take much to say that there will be blood has the same kind of acting, the same kind of melodrama, but that they're setting this in the past, for one thing. And then, in like, I'm wrapping up here on this subject, but the point... <laughs> sorry, class, I got a little uh, droggled there. I almost started over, but what I was going to say is Intolerance is the one that has the modern sequence. The modern sequence in There Will Be Blood. There's guilt, frustration human emotion, we've seen it in other films. And it's like that book Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes, the philosophy book. There are like senses and sounds and things we feel and hear and touch. And if those things that are technologically advanced can put us in a medium like cinema where there are things we can see and hear, it just doubles the sensory perception of the movie. And I'm not bagging on silent film because they got all the best scores for the old silent films. But the score for There Will Be Blood is legendary too because it's by the guitarist from, uh, I want to say Radiohead. And I should look on the back cover, but it's too small to read, you know. And it won some, it won some Oscars. And all I'm getting at with these two comparisons is that like, you can't really blame Intolerance for not having sound, but for being shot in its era in kind of a nostalgic way about its own era, whereas There Will Be Blood, again, is a flashing back to the past, further to the past, and it's to right when the technological industrial revolution is about to begin, just like the scenes in Intolerance with like the train and the car chasing it and the last minute rescue and the whole hangman's noose. It's like... These are the kind of intense hurdles you have to fly through. But let's move on because I, there was something else I was going to say about Dan, Daniel Dave Lewis. Daniel Dave Lewis appears in one that we're going to talk about today of Gangs of New York. And I don't think it's any accident that they were both kind of like silent film directed. Like there's a scene in Gangs of New York that's straight out of Battleship Potemkin by Sergei Eisenstein. I mean, the thing follows the stylistic medium of the film. And then these broad painterly brush strokes. That's Paul Thomas Anderson. That's what I was trying to say. Is the painterly movements of Paul Thomas Anderson really make you feel like you're in the film and kind of floating along, being part of it being made. And then in Gangs of New York, they did that in the silent era. You know, they did make movies about movies even in the silent era, but one that only really comes to mind 
is Buster Keaton when he makes that movie. I know there's that 1928 show, people, but there's this Buster Keaton movie where he is making a movie about making a movie. And there's the one, of course, where the cameraman, where the monkey films the scene. And in the cameraman, this monkey's on his shoulder and it's filming this scene all over town and cutting the footage, editing the footage later, it turned out to be this total avant-garde film that blew everybody in Hollywood away. Yeah, like a monkey film, you know, and it's like these silent films are like that because, you know, they're funny and they stick out because they're about the modern era and yet they, like the one that I have to bring up is Buster Keaton's um, The General. Because in 1926, 1927, when The General came out, there was still the general consensus that Birth of a Nation was kind of this Western that rooted for like Southern Confederacy kind of things that stood for the South. And everybody in Hollywood moved that way until about, I want to say Santa Fe Trail was the last one where Custer was the hero. So that kind of shifted the politics back the other way. And then everybody ironically gets blacklisted, right? But I'm not like really looking to see who is right and wrong about any of that, but speaking of rights and wrongs, you have the right to watch this film because really it's a beautiful masterpiece. And again, we take the Griffith style, we improve upon it with these directors. I mean, Martin Scorsese far better than Griffith in all of his terms. And I'm not just saying that old films are usually the ones that set the precedent that are better, but these are the new films that show us what the old films reflect in the new way that they're perceived in the new film. Because you take this film by Martin Scorsese, for example, and again, Daniel Day-Lewis is in this kind of like Griffith caricature. And Griffith does so many pieces about, you know, the modern actor that's, or the modern day worker that's in a, you know, going to the industrial revolution and going to be part of it, but is also like high class, sometimes aristocratic. But in this, we have a better take on class because the really rich are blending in with the really poor and it's the God save all because everybody's out to kill everybody in this. I mean, every, the three people on the cover have to kill each other in this and there are some people that die and it will be blood. But what this one really reminds me of is the birth of a nation in a way. Because they all build up to this ultra frenzy at the end where the day is barely saved by the good and not the evil. And they're practically in some kind of like position, Cameron Diaz and DiCaprio, in the position of like the northern and southern love interest and work of nations. There are similarities there that I think anyone should check out. But I'm not saying that Daniel Day Lewis planned this all or that Paul Thomas Anderson and Scorsese, I don't know how much how much they know each other or what. I've read some film books. And I remember reading Scorsese saying about this film was that he filmed it on the set that Satyricon was filmed on. And it was this it was this a studio in Italy where Satyricon by Fellini was made. Sinicetta, I think it's called and Gar and Games of New York was a really flawless technically and flawless stylistically, so you can't judge it for being like anything bad because it's everything great. And the only reason I bring that up is because it's kind of got this modern tempo to it, but it's a total throwback to the classical way of making films. And the classical way of making films is no other than founded by the birth of a nation. Now, as much as we're haunted by some of the things that are described and depicted, even in versions that may be more, like, intersected and edited in different ways. Because the birth of a nation is the war epic, and this is a gangster battle. You know, it's like Musketeers of Pig Alley featured in the subplot of Birth of a Nation, because here it's not exactly the same time era. I mean, these guys are flashing back to the Civil War. And these guys are during the Civil War. So what we've got to realize is there actually are some continual makings of a metaphor of the, of the Civil War. And it's funny, we find out just by thinking about those films, yeah, they both take place during the Civil War. Yeah, these are potentially true battles. 
yeah, the things that are happening here are probably realistic. And it's that realism that comes from Italian neorealism that really blends in with the film. And I like the modern acting, too. The modern acting is pleasant. So really, I'm not trying to say that they outdid... No, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm trying to say that they kind of outdid Griffith anyway, because there were such incredible filmmakers to come along and use that style. And the classical Hollywood mode is like where you have the kind of this establishing shot. And then you go into the next level and it's like the next shot. And then you go in further and it's like a body shot, you know, and then a bus shot and then a head shot. And you can shoot them in two directions and have a whole set planned of people having a conversation. Now, you got to watch out for what Alfred Hitchcock and Hitchcock Truffaut said. Never make a movie that's just heads with talking people. But the funny thing about this master class is it's a head of a talking person or people or whatever. It's just, you know, like, but we're pretty good at figuring out that we're not just here to say that everything worked out in the modern era as good as Griffith did. Because Griffith is one of my favorites, if not my favorite director. I mean, I know that's blasphemy in the courts of so many people that would say, well, he f this up, he f that up. But he went for it. You know, he went for it balls out. I mean, he got kicked to the ground, he got dick dirted, he got thrown in jail, nobody gave a crap, still probably don't. Hated upon long after he died, the Griffith's curse was. He was in jail 10 years, fought the war for all the others. Going backwards, we're in the sound era, barely making it, and still somehow cobbling it together before it all ransacked and ran dry. But that's the Griffith story epic. It really is an epic that nobody's ever told, and that's because not many biographies are about that because there's a kind of a lack of interest. But you can see how these mastery directors like Paul Thomas Anderson and Martin Scorsese use that style to their own mastery and quite confound the like of it. I, I prefer the modern pictures on these, not because I feel so much totally that Griffith stated, but that these are such up-to-date films that they really play well in today's era. And I highly recommend, don't, you don't have to see the Griffith ones to know that they knew a little thing about syntax themselves that they brought into the shelf of being these kind of, just trust me, they're kind of auteurs of their own, you know? They bring in this own director style and they prove to the world that they can put their own personal message onto a movie the way an artist would be painterly like we talked about. And make full painting swipes. And Griffith's more like a photo, right? But not like a painting which is all swished about. But a photo which is a hard, tack shaped object of what you're taking pictures of. And both ways work really in the post-modern era because then you get the, the frame looking the way you want it with like digital effects, which can be really, really well done for a film. And there are some of those in their wealthy blood, but they're so subtle that the thing is practically all shot with like long takes and deep focus. And it's like this really beautiful melody of mise-en-scene and montage. I really appreciate their will be blood. And then Gangs of New York, one of the most time awesome. Because here you have Leonardo DiCaprio and Cameron Diaz in this whole movie, and like I was saying, like in Birth of a Nation, they're like that couple because they're from different sides of the tracks, but that they're trying to off each other, that there's a really interesting scene in an opium den. And I was going to skip that part, but in Masterclass, I, I don't fear talking about how I wonder how stoned Leonardo DiCaprio was in that scene. Because he gets stoned in the movie, and it's like, well, why not talk about how stoned he was in the movie? Was he stoned for real, man? I want to know. So audiences out there, let it be a master class fact that we don't even know if they were using real weed on the set. It might have been that fake weed like we used to get back in the day. That we pretended it was real. No, I'm just kidding. I never got weed that bad. Or that class, I kind of got off track. High Plains Drifter, and that's Griffith's thing, though, because he tried to legalize weed, get it? I'm speaking of class. Griffith tries to legalize weed after World War I and World War II, appealing that the soldiers that have PTSD can be treated with it. Now, one more Birth of a Nation film I want to bring up is my Clint Eastwood copy of, what is it? High Plains Drifter. And... 
I wouldn't exactly say it's Clint Eastwood's first movie because he did one called Play Misty for me a few years earlier. But this was his first Western, I want to say. And there were, there were other Westerns that they had made on television with Clint Eastwood, so it's kind of hard to tell if there was a TV movie that Clint Eastwood is in. In the TV archive somewhere in North L.A., I'm sure you could find out what all shows Clint Eastwood played on TV and see if they were on and see if you could, like, get recordings of it. I mean, that's got to be vintage material, some of those old Clint Eastwood TV shows. And now we're saying, so TV is this new medium. And, like, you can see in, in Tolerance how this tracking shot from small to far away is going to be, like, kind of a theme in TV from now on of you know, really far away from the subject or really close to the subject. Usually it's pretty static in the middle. Like, we're not editing for anything sharp here, but in High Plains Drifter, you get this Griffith sense of freedom with the editing, so you can interlock all these different frames going in different narratives in different directions, all into one interlock of one kind of episodic centam. And you get that idea from High Plains Drifter that intolerance has these shots that go from front to down, but as far as the editing chip chops around, it's a lot more like these two movies, Intolerances, uh, Inception, for instance. And I'm not done with High Plains Drifter yet. But Inception, I just got to bring up that um, Intolerance has these four narratives that are spliced all together. And Inception has all these different scenes that splice together from the same characters, some containing different characters, in the same movie that descended into a dream that they built five parts down, like Sargasson manuscript down, into this mind of five dreams at once that are all going on at once. And everybody's having their dreams at once, and the way we know is it's a parallel cross-cutting narrative between the four events. But they're kind of all happening in the same frame of dream time, which is surreal and can't be defined. But in Intolerance, the four scenes that are sliced all together are all from different eras. And they're all from different vantage points. I'm not really sure what the Jesus one was supposed to represent. But the final one with the modern times, we talked about it being like, there will be blood. And then the second part of that with the whole Valentine's Day massacre and or Valentine's Day, or and or in the French War. So an earlier Valentine, you know, would be the name of the movie. Or My Bloody Valentine should have been that one. That was Griffith's version of My Bloody Valentine. This just in. And then you get uh, the first one, which is the sequence in Babylon. And why I'm talking about TV is because if you see the way that whole scene is monitored on the stairs, you have shots covering each pod like they do with a football game. And they do these different zonings around and get like shots of this bric-a-brac on TV that and with TV, it's like commercialism, so you're selling a product, but you're, the product is the show or thing you're working on that's most important. And why we call it a product is only because it, what's, it's what comes out of all our mechanical and labor and monetary labor and everything that goes into a filmmaking. But it's like with these intolerance films and these inception similarities is that they're both so epic and both blow sky high and both become these exaggerated masses of like these dream sequences that are these four different stories connected. But in inception, they build it and in intolerance, everything's already falling apart. It's like the end from the beginning to the end of that movie. And I'm not saying though that again, whether or not Griffith's version or Christopher Nolan's version is better. I prefer both in this case because they're not exactly mis mismatched similar, except for that they bomb through four different, five different plots at once in Inception's case. And they blow through those different shots so fast that you're thinking, well... It's different movies at the same time or it's different things that are happening in different dreams at different times within the framework of the editing, which is always flowing at a certain pace itself. Now, you learn something about editing, flowing at a certain pace, but yet there are scenes that are chippy chopped or like edited in that are smaller or bigger 
into the whole timeline. So it feels like you're kind of working yourself out to the end. And then you kind of work yourself your way back in. And I'm just saying the point of that is, is they have these long stretches and and then they'll have a different episode. And just like Griffith, they'll switch between the editing in each of the individual shots and individual scenes. Like they're running a regular movie. Like here's a shot of the dude, here's a shot of what he's holding, here's a shot of his cane, and here's a shot of his dog coming along, you know. They're all filmed in individual shots and they're all edited so seamlessly that you barely even notice how the flame, frame switches and you're just, just so used to the frame switching and intolerance is the same way I mean the edit's normal but then it jumps between scenes and this jumps between scenes and edit's normal too and it kind of open kind of like stylistic like these are all connected together but it's kind of random but not really how we put them back together in those sequences so I think you can kind of see how Intolerance and Inception are related in editing style. Especially, like, the editing style of Christopher Nolan in Inception. He's going between five dreams at once down to the bottom dream, and it's so intense the way they all match up with each other. Interestingly enough, in Griffith's Intolerance, the worlds don't really impress upon each other, like they're all independent, except for what we psychologically represent from our mind to be thinking about why they chose to edit here to there, like that had some greater meaning to it. When the editing was jumping from whole scenario to whole scenario, they weren't connected stories. They were connected thematically. But Inception, they're connected by this whole big woven dream that's kind of the grand narrative of the dream, the big editing timeline. So we can see how those films are similar. And then back to Hype and Drifter. So this is the Western that I love about modern Westerns is that they have these kind of stranger hanged man guys that are coming into town to clean up Dodge or whatever. And now it's not just like as tough as Jimmy Stewart would be with Winchester 73 and all. I really wouldn't want to have... A showdown with Clint Eastwood in any movie, dude. Especially because he's the guy from Good, the Bad, and the Ugly that stands there for like 20 minutes and then kills everybody in two shots, you know? But I'm just saying that, you know, he's one of the badasses of the silver screen, and I think that Clint Eastwood is a great actor, great director. He did direct this movie, like I said, like a few years after Play Misty for Me, which is an interesting movie, but about a topic I don't really want to get into. Because it's not that the movie is controversially held, it's a well-made movie, it just seems to be a bit of a taboo subject and not convention. But anyway, High Plains Drifter, on the other hand, is so meticulously put together that the fashionable use of modern close-ups are also modeled after the Sergio Leone films, which were actually a, year, a few years before this movie. And not many years before this movie, because Once Upon a Time in the West, you see, came out in 1969. And that was the fourth part to A Fistful of Dollars for a Few Dollars More, and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And then Once Upon a Time in the West kind of concluded all that, and those were the films that Clint Eastwood trained on, although he wasn't in Once Upon a Time in the West, that was Henry Fonda. But High Plains Drifter is like the Sergio Leone's where it frames in center frame and holds them all to this like kind of close-up effect. Now, I know a lot of this is just cover art and we're all looking at this like, oh, brandish this beautiful cover art and you can kind of see him riding Clint Eastwood on his horseback there. And what I love about Birth of a Nation is the horseback riding in it, although we're not liking the subject matter, again, a taboo, but... The horseback riding is flawless. I mean, it's like seamless. Sometimes it looks overblown and out-edited, but I think the the horse track footage, I mean, it goes right back to the beginnings of like betting on a horse race to start cinema out. You know, it's like, well, we got to put all the cameras in a row, see if all the hooves come off the ground. I love these kind of Western movies. They make me really patriotic and they make me feel like, you know, 
tough and that America is a tough country and these are the kind of people we have and it's all ironic because Sergio Leone was Italian and he was making most of those Clint Eastwood movies both in like studios like Cinecetta back in America and Hollywood Hollywood and he's kind of jumped between the Europe scene more than many times kind of has that flavor to him but he's underrated too because he makes westerns but I wanted to bring it up because Really, the star of Birth of the Nation, as we all know, is Lillian Gish, and that's not a fair comparison to Clint Eastwood, right? But except for that they're megaloton movie stars. They're, like, almost ahead of all the other movie stars in Hollywood, like Lillian Gish and Clint Eastwood are, like, the biggest stars of all, you know. But then they say there are other stars that are, too, like, you know, like Cary Grant, this megalostar, you know. But you don't think of him as being as much of a megalostar as Clint Eastwood. I mean, it just seems like the hierarchy can't go any higher, you know. You're at the tail end of it. The greatest summation of, of the things we love about movies are High Plains Drifter. And what reminds me of Verse of the Nation is not only is it, like, part of... Again, they're always set somewhat in the Civil War, although this cast... In the Civil War, I'm going to read this. It says, Clint Eastwood returns to his familiar Old West stomping grounds and his internationally acclaimed role of the man with no name in High Plains Drifter. So he's back as the guy from the freaking Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. This time the stranger, Mr. Eastwood, mysteriously, mysteriously appears out of the heat waves of the desert and rides into the lawless, sin-ridden town of Lego. After to prove... After making a name for himself the string of blazing gun battles, the stranger is hired by the townspeople to provide protection from the three ruthless gunmen just out of jail. Directed by Clint Eastwood himself, this pulse-pounding shoot 'em up recognized as one of his signature Western classics. That was an amazing back cover, and that's why it's fancy to have these things called DVDs and Blu-rays, not just because the movie is such a perfect print of it you can watch in a beautiful medium, but because these designs of the casing and how they've described the movie, and you know what I'm talking about. I don't have to go back over. It's just well written about the movie. And what I really got out of it was that exactly what we were saying. They're continuing the Sergei Leone. They're continuing the Griffith tradition. The Griffith tradition is the Old West. I know John Ford really made the Iron Horse the Old West, but that's a very Griffith-like movie, the Iron Horse. It's a lot like... Uh, Birth of a Nation, The Iron Horse. And there's movies all around the silent era that are like Birth of a Nation. Like, my friend was telling me that Inferno was a movie I should bring up today. And I was like, well, Inferno I like to bring up every once in a while. And I announced that Giuseppe Riguero was the director. But Inferno I bring up because only was it 1911 that they had these big crowd movements. And I like, one thing Birth of a Nation has is a lot of crowds. And you can't do crowds like that anymore without CGI. Like, the crowds that are in Birth of the Nation are so big and so wild that to set up a crowd like that would be illogistically impossible these days. Not because there's not so much because there's less room, but because it would cost so much more for the people, the equipment, everything to put there nowadays, not just because of inflation, but just because prices are hard-driven towards the best stock that you would need to make a movie like that. So now you're prepared with this big budget. And the bit first big budget film we're going to see really was, in America, was Birth of the Nation that started this whole chain of events that would become American cinema. And what's horrible about it is we all came out detesting the subject matter and then we're like, well, that's pretty much how movies are going to be from now on. And it's not really ever a racist cinema too bad. There are some moments that we've had in cinema that have been atrocious, but... I've always thought most of the racism is represented as a bad thing, and I'm not so sure that Griffith wasn't representing it as a bad thing, but whether he was or not, his films had these motivated crowds that are all massed together, and they're all bunched together, and they're all kind of pushed in to the frame. And again, we have these very photogenic pictures. But in these movies that we're talking about also, like this one seems a little more digitally photographed than, than these others like there will be blood looks more like a film painting or something and I'm not saying they look anything different than a regular movie but 
I'm saying they outstand the rest because they kind of have this driven style that's narrative all their own and these powerhouse auteurs of their own directing it. So we've gotten through quite a bit of what I was going to talk about today. It's good because I had that whole stack of movies. I could also talk about how Mulholland Drive is actually like the advent of a film that really exists in the modern era as, again, kind of a rejection of the code of Griffiths, but also following it because David Lynch is kind of of this Cecil B. Demented school in a good way. That he wants to be all directors at once. You know, you be all directors at once. All your favorite directors at once. I'd be like, you know, here comes my Spike Lee, my Robert Zemeckis. You know, I'd put all my favorite directors at once. And David Lynch has to get, like, his Kenneth Anger and his Andy Warhol out, you know. And so, what I'm saying is, is this is more of a modern design that seems ahead of its time, avant-garde in nature, surreal. But creates a code of cinematic images that is beyond just the simple thrust of the classical narrative. The classical narrative being within the decision-making of the timeline without the film and everything that exists within that timeline that flows throughout. As a new code of ethics, the new cinema has, so too does a new style become born. And by ethics, I mean, in these kind of dramaturgies, you can have a relationship between a woman and a woman in love. And there are things like that not seen in these other movies. And it's not accidental that this is one of the most originally made movies that it's not really, it could refer to Griffith style. If he, if David Lynch really wants it to be Griffith style, I'm sure he would just wave his hand at the screen and it would turn into that. He kind of can have the on-off switch where he can kind of create a language of his own. Now, I'm not saying all these directors don't have languages of their own. That's what really makes you an auteur is to have a language of your own. That is a confluent verbiage of what things get understood and done and said around when you were directing that gets picked up on film. And that's how you can tell when it's an auteur is there's a timeline to the story they're telling. And it's like this grand narrative that plays a part in this whole story they're telling with all the bric a brac of films. And they're big things, films. They're not small bric a brac. They're big things. They're, they'll hurdle a stadium. They'll be huge in all cities. They're, you know, and then you get this thing called classical cinema in there finally determining itself in a new way with the postmodern Mulholland Drive. And what's interesting about the style being independent is that you can just to see how easily a movie like this could exist with or without Griffith, only to say that it's got such original style that you can't ever see anything like it again or everything before, but it starts this whole, like, let's make original style. We don't have to be caught in this, like, Griffith, you know, copy cutter. We don't have to be, like, only one way in classical. And that's why in this one, it's kind of neoclassical, the way he brings in these things like bebop music. and The soundtrack's incredible, and like the, the look of like a dirty dish falling to the sink, you know, and then it's like next thing you know, there's monsters behind dumpsters. Now, I don't want to give too much away. <laughs> but the cowboy has talked to this director, and the director gets on the phone, and he's like, it's just been that kind of a day, that movie, you know? Where the chicks go to that theater and they're watching Yorondo, that song, Yorondo, I'm Crying Over You. You know, I think we've gone over some of these movies, but the reason I bring it up in Griffith class, and I do have more to talk about here for about 10 more minutes, but here in Griffith class, we're not seeing many similarities, or maybe you were seeing all similarities, or maybe by Mulholland Drive there's an expiration date, and it doesn't matter at that point because we're still agglomerating all of the favorite directors of our career, and some of them can or can't be mentioned, and it wouldn't matter because if it's David Lynch, you got to move out of the way anyway. He's the head of the AFI and Directors Guild. So I wouldn't mess with him if I was you. I wouldn't fuck with that guy. <laughs> I wouldn't even as a joke. Not even as a joke.
I mean, that's the kind of director you gotta be. I mean, Martin Scorsese's attitude is director you kind of gotta be. But we're gonna look deep. Speaking of package design, package reading, if I can get this out, yeah, uh, free me. There's a few things I wanted to read to you that are of interest on that are on disc one of this Blu-ray that's from Kino Video, A Birth of a Nation, and I highly recommend some of these newer movies as well as these Griffith versions that are so fun to study. And sometimes we do study it for discovery. Like, I'm not saying anything against the films that pastiched Griffith, like There Will Be Blood and everything else. And that was very Eric von Stroheim's greed, too. You know, you can see those elements all throughout There Will Be Blood. But I'm not saying that just to get you interested in them. I want you to go and buy them. These are great films. These are the great films. So if they are like Griffith or not, like, you know, David Lynch, he could be. But at that point, you're like, well, I definitely see more Kenneth Anger and Andy Warhol in that, you know. So it's saying The Birth of the Nation newly remastered in HD from archival 35 millimeter elements. Music by the Mont Alto Motion Picture Orchestra. There's, there you go. There's a case of a silent film that had a score later scored for it by composers that worked in an orchestra that made music match up to the images in this version of Birth of the Nation. It's the Mont Alto Motion Picture Orchestra. This one's in 2.0 stereo. The one I found on computer is actually a better version than this in 4K, but let's just say it has spoken introductions by D.W. Griffith and Walter Houston including the newly rediscovered intermission sequence. That's that baldaring sequence that has the stupidest sequence, because Walter Houston, who may have been, like, high as a kite at the time, I think, was in the office, and he was talking to D.W. Griffith, and D.W. Griffith is like, no, I see the rise of the clan, or he's, like, repeating his dad's Confederate speech, you know, <laughs> And it's like, when I'm, <laughs> I don't mean to tail off, but if Griffith's reading this scene about, like, from where is he getting this script from, like, there's a host of this show, kind of, radio show, maybe? A film trailer for the re-release of Birth of the Nation. Now, this is this, almost the sound era. It is the sound era. And he can't get it released for nothing, and he even tries to make a sound version, but fails, doesn't even complete it falls on his ass trying to complete the sound version of Birth of the Nation. And the way he wanted the clan to come back was kind of demented in that one. Yeah, that, I didn't like that. Walter Houston's like too stunned to really know what's going on. He's like laughing about it. They're all, hey, 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 we're like henchmen for the clan forever. And you always hear that rumor about henchmen for clan. So did the henchmen for the clan, are they still out there? You know, and it's like, I'm not going to go questioning the clan. Curiosity killed the cat. I'm not going to go questioning some organization that's underground and say that this is what they can or can't do because I'm not at allegiance with that or affiliated, but I don't know how those underground operations were really organized, but why Griffith would want the Klansmen to come back out from underground and rise as a clan at the re-release of Birth of a Nation it just seems like an upset at that time for the whole career. And for this, even though it was for communism that they blacklisted him, this was a big thing, reason he got blacklisted was because he was bringing the Klan from underground so they could all be there for the re-release of the sound version of Birth of a Nation and the whole project toppled over on itself. Civil rights had progressed too much by then. They kept forgetting that the Civil War wasn't when Birth of the Nation was made. It was years before when it was actually going on. It was like 50 years before it was going on, you know. So let's move on and see what else we got on this disc. The reason I'm reading this is because this gives us some idea of the documentaries that come along with these special editions of these films that are like travesties on the one hand, horrible versions of history, like some have been, like Italian neorealism, like Paisan. You know, it's so horrible to see the good soldiers die, you know. But in these kind of movies, it's like if there wasn't an original plan to rise the clan from showing this movie, then Griffith still tries to, but by then the Civil War is a lost remnant. 
They can't get the movie to work. Griffith never works again. Just do a DVD. That's just a little addendum I thought I'd throw in. Because <laughs> that's about... I mean, I like these discs, but they don't even warn you that those guys are sitting there going, well, it's come Dark Clan Rising. You know, it's like, oh, shit, man. I don't know any secrets, but... I think Woodrow Wilson was the grand freaking dragon, according to the credits. So, you know... It's like, what the frick? If they're not making it about the clan, then why is the movie based on the Klansman? You know, and if Rufus all defending it as non-racist later, you know, in the same breath of fresh air, he's probably with his black friends. Well, I'm not a racist, you know. <laughs> How diligent he would be if he lived with the black guys constantly. They're like, yeah, don't patronize me, you know, or whatever they said. I'm not trying to be stereotypical. No, 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 I'm just saying, like, Griffith barely gave anyone breathing room. And the next thing he's going to do is complain that it's a, a non-racist film taken in a racist way. And then later he's going to try and bring it back with sound film and bring a clan above ground. Something's not adding up here. I think we missed something the first time around when you said it wasn't a racist film, Griffith. <laughs> it's like... First time you said it wasn't racist, now you're saying it's supposed to be. I'm not sure who to believe in now when you defend yourself again. The other way, you're going to really seem like, you know, an Indian giver of time because you're like, well, <laughs> I want it. He's like, I want it back. I want it back as my film. <laughs> I want it back as my film that did a good deed for all. You know, it's like, but, sorry guys. I don't know if this film's racist or not. I'm going to spend time watching it. No, 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 not at all. Well, yeah, that's pretty bad. Yeah, that's pretty bad. I mean, come on. What was Griffith thinking? I mean, the first time he showed it, he's like, no, it's not racist at all. He was probably put up to say that by Woodrow Wilson. Come on, come all to the big circus event, you know? And the Cecil B. DeMille Griffith circus events are kind of like the original media circuses of their time taking place on screen. Because they're like a cluster blank of everything swarming each other and linking to each other and then kind of like just pulling from the center and exploding into these disastrous results and disastrous reactions. And all Griffith can say is that the 1930 version is, well, I'm glad the clan is back. You know, I mean, what, it, what are we supposed to say to that? Can we really ever venerate Griffith, even though all the rest of his films pretty much rocked except two or three? We found three or four, maybe, that weren't that good, but the rest were really good. And we got to keep forgetting that we keep forgetting that he directed True Heart Susie. And True Heart Susie was kind of the one I was going to bring up about Mulholland Drive, too. Is because there's such a coincidence about the two brothers that fight on the North and the South that the female that goes with the brother that had to kill the other brother in war. And he told her, his brother, that killed him to take care of his wife, so he marries her. I've said that plot on the show. And Mulholland Drive has these switchback narratives, too, where it's like one guy discovers two girls, and, like, one of them might be dead, and the other one's alive, and they're doppelgangers. And, again, we had that whole Caligari effect, even with David Lynch, and the Art Nouveau movements, and... Leo Carax, uh, you know, subway type movement. But we've had quite a master crash, my friends. We've been burned through some movies and barely touched the surface on any of them. I still can't imagine how class five from now is going to be like still talking about the same subject over and over. And I apologize that we get so race cardy with this show and I'm not even going to comment on that this time because one of these days we'll get to a show where we can just breeze through some narrative styles and one narrative technique that I've seen flow through all of these is kind of a temporality that examines time, that takes in time, that takes in the most important objectives of time and presses upon them the narrative of the media and film form that it is about to press upon the film stock that's coming across now digitally and digitally remastered as this ever-moving film progresses in these, like, dementedly huge ways. Cecily dementedly huge ways. The set is lifted. It's like Griffith could predict the eccentricity you would need 
you know, to direct a controversial disaster. And a controversial disaster is everybody's favorite kind of summer film, right? Like, I mean, he might as well have invented popcorn at this point. That'd be the only score he didn't get. It's like, popcorn was invented by, like, some other breed of character somewhere else. No, I don't know. But, <laughs> what Groove has brought as an institution with Hollywood was the capability of making these kind of spectacles that were already seen again on sound stages like like the original Italian sword and sandal movies like Cabaria and even going back to Inferno where strange costumes loom or maybe real demons were filmed. And I love films like that from this island era where they say there's real demons in the film. Because if you look at the film directly, this is Inferno, a couple of masterpieces before this even came out and it was 1911 it's one of the first feature films in italy and what i don't understand is when they're watching it they say there's real demons in the film like you can really see the demons in the film like it really films the pit of hell and i'm going and that's where paparazzi and publicity come from best is telling us it's all the real deal and yet having the Muppet costume of a lifetime, bro, that was classic. I mean, I'm not making fun of your special effects. They far exceed mine, and yes, there are real demons in the film, okay? That's not what I'm getting at. I mean, that dragon was off the chain puppetry, bro, <laughs> in Inferno. And it's like, well, all these special effects are colliding with these, like, sword and sandal ideals, like these extreme movies, but this is like the first movie that's full length that survived. I mean, there might be something, somebody bring me something in 1910. I mean, I feel like going on the internet right now and seeing if there's anything in 1910 in cinema where we're looking, because that, yeah, that's around the time of Griffith's ordination into film from Edwin Porter into the eventual biograph narrative. But in 1909, he was starring in Edison's Porter's movie about an eagle rescued on a mountainside that picks up the E.W. Griffin and he starts to ride on an eagle, eagle, bro. So what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? <laughs> I just had to sing that because it seems like that's about all I can scheme up today and I'm not quitting early just for your sake, but for all of us at Masterclass, we'll catch you next week and just remember to try and stay caught up on, on the internet, these sites the display where Griffith's movies are found. Uh, there's several ones you can look up on the internet, and YouTube is my favorite way to patch into a network of these Griffith films. Take a couple of snapshots of them, and then compare them to some of the films we, we looked at today, like Gangs of New York and There Will Be Blood. Ironically, both with Daniel Day-Lewis, this is great. So if you see a similarity in the movie, this could be something we could think about down the road as a test question is what films nowadays remind us of the great epics and great disaster movies and great editing and of D.W. Griffith. And I'm not just talking about him to tell you he's the best, but these other directors nowadays are actually reflecting as even more amazing directors than he was. Because if he's going to pass the baton, wouldn't you want to pass it to someone greater than him? Or would he still go around lording it out over everybody? I don't know. The point is, is that's not really the point. How you direct isn't always a personality thing or how you look, act, or talk. It can kind of be a secret engine that kind of flows through you and you build it as it goes, like this kind of Minecraft first-person POV. You're building this big set in front of you and filming it as you go, you know. There are different ways to make movies that are all director's techniques, Griffith's ability to take a 365-page script, make Birth of a Nation from his mind, was one of his super techniques, and they all have superhuman skills, these auteurs. And his was to memorize an entire script, no matter how long it was, and film exactly like it. But that's why I don't understand why Birth of a Nation is nothing like the script, because actually the script has many, many parts of it that aren't in the movie that could have been more pros and cons either way. But either way you look at it, while it fails modern audience expectation of a plot narrative acceptable, even in schools to this day controversial, 
and totally should be for every reason. I don't know quite where to place the film in my own mind other than I kind of prefer, as a film myself, I kind of prefer High Plains of Drifture. Because you have the same guy as like a hero, comes into the town and, you know, he's going to clean things up. He saves like some like baby to his mother and gives her to the father and sends him home. I mean, here we got a fistful of dollars already happening. And these are scenarios that are like the Griffith, John Ford, Kenneth way and that goes on to like Hitchcock and Kubrick and all these directors Steven Spielberg and Scorsese Orson Welles is in there and the great thing about Orson Welles is he loved D.W. Griffith he thought D.W. Griffith was the shiznit Orson Welles one of his favorite directors was D.W. Griffith and he always said it was perfection to be clear that be sound in a picture D.W. Griffith had promoted and predicted and directed it otherwise by then. That's an Orson Welles quote that we can't forget about my man, G.W. Griffith, loved and hated, did one bad thing and a hundred else good, only because you tried to legalize weed are we forgiving you. All right, class, we'll see you next week. Take care. Check in next time for more classes until the end. All right, we'll see you then.